And our first speaker actually needs no introduction. She's already been introduced multiple times across multiple slides. Uh, BJ Casey from Weill Medical College. It's so cool to be introduced by a, uh, a Sacklerite. I hope you don't mind me calling you that. And Dave. Ah, yay, okay, we got it going on. So, um, 20 minutes. So the first thing we're gonna do is applaud Bea. Um, there are many of us here because of Bea. <laughs> But I'm glad it all came together and we know these meetings are a lot of work. Um, I could spend 20 minutes on the next slide in terms of all the different people who have influenced our thinking and the work that I'll present today. Um, but I'm going to move on. And uh, today what I'd like to do is um, really focus on an area of fear learning. And I think Bruce set up this eclectic uh, grouping of lectures very well in terms of thinking about learning as plasticity and also how experiences can shape learning. And one of the reasons I wanna focus on fear learning is because of the high prevalence of fear-related disorders. So about 20% over the course of a lifespan, uh, your, over the course of your life, um, if you look at the statistics, there is almost uh, 10, 15, up to 20% prevalence of the anxiety disorders. And the reason why we're really interested in those is because even though they're emerging during childhood, you get um, a peak in the diagnosis of these disorders around adolescence. And the only evidence-based treatment, behavioral evidence-based, is CBT, which is basically identifying what's causing the anxiety and then trying to desensitize the individual and give them coping strategies for dealing with that um, anxiety. Welcome, Jay. <laughs> Unfortunately, only about, this really is like a family reunion. It's really crazy. I mean, it's so like, this is your life. Um, so for, for many of us, not just me and Karen, it's so good to see you again too from my NIMH days. Um, so let's get back uh, to why it's um, a little bit confusing and concerning when you have such a high prevalence of a disorder and yet you have close to 50% not responding to an evidence-based treatment, then we need to figure out what's going on and see how we can advance the field further. So the objectives of the research that we've been doing um, is really trying to understand how the brain is changing during adolescence, transitioning into and out of this period that might help explain um, some of these statistics and also to use this knowledge to try to inform who's gonna to respond to what treatment and when ultimately what we wanna do is really develop novel treatments that go beyond our standard practice of care. And so let me just give two highlight slides that are going to ground the um, sort of parallel human and mouse studies that I want to talk about from here. And that is there have been two observations in the field, in our labs and others, that suggest right around the time of adolescence when anxiety is peaking, there may be this tension and how systems deep in the brain are reacting or interacting with cortical systems. And this goes back to Rakesh's work at Huttenlocker in terms of subcortical systems as well as sensory motor seem to be fine tuning earlier and developing earlier than frontal systems that actually um, are very important for dampening emotional responses and very important for regulation of our behavior. And Adriana Galvan has driven that work and really um, gone on since leaving the Sackler. And we miss her daily. Um, but what's really interesting when you do developmental work is that there is so much individual variability. And so while you might get a heightened response during this period of time, what's associated when things are going awry or might become pathological. And so there's also a number of groups have sort of shown this as well. I'd like to say it's our own discovery, but Todd Hare was really instrumental in showing that if you take an adolescent who rates themselves anonymously, which is very important with teenagers, as whether or not they're low or high anxiety in everyday ratings, basically what you see when you present them with potential cues of threat, such as a fearful face, um, you see bilateral activation of the amygdala, 
And with repeated presentations, eventually they habituate or they desensitize. Because in this context, nothing is happening to them. It's very important that they be alerted just in case something is, right? This is how we learn to avoid threatening things. This pattern is very different from somebody who reports high anxiety in that they activate this region, but with repeated presentations, not only do you see that they don't habituate, but you actually see, you see sensitization and increases in these regions. So it's patterns like these that sort of beg the question of what's going on? What are individual factors that might play a role here? And I want to just, in the next um, whatever minutes I have left, try to um, give you some examples of different ways in which um, our behavior and the brain might be fine-tuned or be predisposed uh, for anxiety and maybe resistance to treatment as well. And the first, because Nim's not presenting, I'm going to highlight some of her work, Nim Tottenham. And um, one extreme uh, experience that you can have in the environment is the adoption experience. Nim really took the lead on Sackler studies that were going on, and she's just carved out this whole new world of science with a brain award, with the brains awards. Basically, this is a period of time when you're in the orphanage where you're not getting contingent sort of uh, regulation from a, a parent. It is disorganized, and part of emotion regulation is not that it magically happens, right? We learn about how to regulate, and we have to have interactions, contingent interactions, and organized parenting to help us um, in regulating our needs. So if you take these individuals, after they've acclimated to being adopted to the US, test them about two years later, and you look and see how well can they regulate their emotions by not attending to emotional information in a task, it's the distractor. Um, what NIM showed is that you basically see elevated activity in these kids who grew up in the orphanage relative to healthy controls who are with their families. And so what's interesting is that you are seeing uh, emotional centers activated in one group, whereas those more um, frontal lobe regions that are very important for not responding uh, to a distractor are activated in the controls. But just looking at simple differences between groups really doesn't tell you a whole lot, right? It could be in your toe, it could be in your ear, whatever. It's when these actually correlate with everyday um, behaviors. And so we were also doing videotapes when the parents were reunited with their children after a brief separation. And Nim was also um, working with Jason Zevin and the lab to look at eye tracking and to see how much they were spending looking at gaze of stimuli in an independent laboratory task. It's really weird talking about NIM study in front of her. Um, and basically what she showed is the uh, greater the activity in this amygdala region, the, m the less you saw them having eye contact with the parent and also the less you saw them looking at the eyes of uh, facial stimuli. Now, naturalistic studies like these um, it's kind of hard to say what came first because you really don't know what the genetics are for these individuals usually. You don't know what um, the prior environment was and what they've been exposed to. So we've done parallel studies in the mouse to try to control the environment and genetics. And let me see if I could play this in the movie for you. This is building on a paradigm that we think mimics perhaps part of the orphanage experience, where we use talibarums taking away the nesting from the dam. This movie, of course, is not in real time. It's sped up. On the top, <laughs> they've had a lot of coffee, which I have too. Um, and so there, you see the mouse is running all over the pups and stepping on them, but not spending much time. Whereas on the bottom, what you're seeing up in that, that corner is the mom spending a lot more time with the, the pups. And that's shown here in this bar graph. Now, we also wanted to have a task that was similar to what was in the human, so we adapted a task um, that's been used in rodents before, and um, we were trying to get them to approach even when there was this possibility of, of threat. Because in the task that Nim used, it was we were looking at um, activations when they were anticipating something, you know, a potential threat that was going to show up. And I'll, I'll show you this analogy in a second. But basically what uh, Matt Malter Cohen, there's a picture of him again, what he did was he trained mice where they could get condensed milk, and they love condensed milk. And so they learned where the nozzle was, and then they put, uh, Matt put the nozzle um, after four days of training them to go to the nozzle to get the milk in an open, bright cage, and then looked at the latency to respond um, to get the uh, condensed milk. 
And basically what he showed is that, um, oh, yeah, earlier, um, pups that grew up with a stressed mom who was trying to get the nesting showed a slower response in the controls. And with CFOS, you were able to show heightened amygdala activity. That in the mice did not change even across development um, in the adults. Uh, when the prefrontal cortex is more mature, and it also, of course, didn't stop after the stressor was removed. Now, this maps on beautifully to data from NIMS study. We've just replotted that here, showing the response latency to neutral cues when they're anticipating a rare threat to occur, how quickly they are to respond, and that we see the same bold activity um, to those threat cues. So that's one experience or environmental factor that can shape behavior might predispose us in a, in a way and change the way that we're, we're viewing the world based on experiences, which may be adaptive for the environment they're in, but not adaptive in, um, in normal situations. The next is a genetic study, and this is basically Hollywood squares of a number of people who played a role in this. And um, I must, I'll come back to these guys who were central, but Dima Amso, Kevin Bath, and Nim Tottenham really drove uh, the design of the next experiments. And about the time we were seeing uh, these individual differences in sort of how you can um, habituate to emotional information, not attend to it or get over it when it's not a potential threat at the moment, uh, Francis Lee was developing a mouse who was showing an anxious phenotype. So this mouse was basically right around adolescence, late adolescence. He was seeing that they were like the wallflower at the dance, so they wouldn't go out into the open field, they were staying around the walls. And this mouse was very interesting to us because it focused on neurotrophin factors as opposed to the standard um, neurotransmitters that have been examined over and over again. And since we were interested in learning how well can you learn when you're safe in a new environment that used to be threatening or to cues that used to be threatening that are now safe, um, we were very interested in this neurotrophin factor. And the mouse was particularly interesting too because it was a knock-in, not a knock-out which um, is more similar to the human condition. Now this is actually a knock-in that biologically mi um, mimics what we're seeing in humans where there's a substitution of methionine in place of valine, and it results in decreased trafficking of the neurotrophin. So, um, so basically we were very excited about trying to explore this more, but also trying to see, is this associated with anxiety? Is this associated with poor learning of when an environment is safe as a, and no longer um, threatening, or when cues are safe and no longer uh, threatening? And we didn't want to go to a high school dance and genotype all the high school students to see who was dancing and who wasn't. So Fatima Solomon decided to use a fear conditioning task. If you're learning, you pair tone with a shock repeatedly. And uh, really only takes two or three little foot shocks um, before the animal is freezing just to the tone alone. But we're most important in the extinction trials where you just present the tone in a new environment to see how quickly they learn. It's no longer an aversive stimulus. In humans, we didn't want to give them a foot shock. And so instead, we use an aversive sound, like when you're trying to hear the Cardinals or the Red Sox or the Yankees or the Pirates. Um, and, and you're losing the station, the radio station, so you don't know if they're winning or not. So we paired this aversive sound with neutral squares, yellow or blue, and then during extinction we just presented the stimuli alone. And instead of looking at freezing behavior, we looked at sweat, the skin conductance response. What we see in the mice is that the wild type mice um, during extinction show decreased freezing when you're just simply playing that tone without the without the shock, and you almost get like this dose response in terms of as you go with the number of increasing meta alleles. So um, you're getting very little learning here in the mouse. In the humans, and we're talking about a polymorphism that's um, the prevalence is about 30% in the Caucasian um, population, we see a similar pattern in skin conductance response. It's not a deficit in learning because if you actually give them twice as many trials, they do get back down to baseline, so it's no genes can explain that much of the variance, right? But it was showing that it's diminishing the learning um, for them. Now, in terms of um, the human, we wanted to make sure that what we were seeing in the extinction was actually mapping on to the nice circuitry that we know about in the rodent literature. So we imaged them during the extinction session and compared those individuals with and without the polymorphism. And what we saw is this area in the prefrontal cortex has projections to the amygdala. It's important in reversal learning and extinction that's been shown by Liz Phelps' work and others 
Um, we see that those individuals with a polymorphism are not showing as much activation of this region as are um, those individuals without. And if you're not activating the prefrontal cortex, um, it's going to be hard for you to extinguish a fear. More importantly, you're probably not going to see down regulation of the amygdala, and what we see is enhanced activity in all three planes in this region of the amygdala relative to those without. So um, these genetic findings, these were all in the adult um, to start. I want to point that out. But they're interesting because they actually suggest that we might be able to use genetics to determine who's going to respond. Let's go back to that first introductory slide to forms of CBT that are really based on principles of extinction, where you're desensitizing the individual to the anxiety, in addition to teaching them coping skills. And that was just a uh, report by an independent group who took our findings, preclinical um, findings, and looked at this in PTSD. And indeed, those individuals who have the polymorphism show less of a treatment response um, than those uh, without the smell So. Now let's take it to development. There have been beautiful, elegant studies that have been done early in development in the rodent and also in adults. But it's only been fairly recently that Richardson and also Francis Lee's group has started looking at the adolescent period and what's going on, uh, going on there. And so Siobhan Pavel working with Francis Lee and Stephanie Dehu, who is a postdoc working in humans with the Sackler, wanted to just sort of map out um, fear extinction across development. And so we used a very similar paradigm to what I described earlier, only it was a three-day three -day paradigm. And basically, this is just showing you in the humans that the acquisition, fear acquisition was the same across groups. That is, when you compare the CS plus, that's say the yellow square that was paired with the aversive sound, um, minus the square that's, that's not, right? We're seeing uh, big differences in GSR. And then if we look at the extinction trials, I guess I'm, I'm just going to stick with uh, bar graphs here for the sake of simplicity. The higher the bar means the more extinction learning. So that's going to be better, the higher the bar. And what we see in the mouse model is um, in pre-adolescence and adults, uh, we're seeing nice extinction and we're seeing diminished extinction in the mouse during the adolescent period. Likewise in the human, we're seeing a very similar trend. So. These results actually suggest when during development, CBT, you might be most uh, receptive to uh, forms of exposure type CBT, but we wanted to look at data and see if there was any proof of principle for this idea and try to get an effect size so we could actually do an experiment and test this. So the proof of principle was actually taking a New England Journal article. John Walkup, who's just moved to Wild Cornell, um, published this where there was a placebo arm and there was uh, at least one clinical arm of CBT. Um, and this is a whole group um, called the CAMS. And an MD-PhD student, uh, Andrew Drysdale, was involved in this too. And basically I'm just going to show you the mouse developmental data, the human, and um, also show you how uh, cross development, the response to CBT in terms of effect size seems to be changing. So here's the mouse, here's the human, and here is um, the uh, difference between pre and post anxiety measures across development. And so um, this is just within a single study. This uh, adult data, since in the CAMS article there were no adults, we did a, used a meta-analysis um, that was most comparable uh, to the developmental study. So these findings hopefully bring us back to um, ways in which we can use preclinical data to possibly inform who and when to treat individuals. It's not always earlier um, because if you come in um, as an, uh, there, there are certain periods if you come into the clinic late where you may be less um, or more resistant to treatment during this adolescent period. It's also not to say that as an adolescent, if you weren't responding to CBT very well, that you won't later, and I think that's very important. We think about this with medications all the time. When do we titrate someone down um, and, um, or take them off a medication? And um, hopefully uh, what we're trying to do now is to sort of take this to the next level, and we're using a lot of what's known about how you can attenuate fear memories um, really uh, persistently, and to use that methodology to try to bypass some of this prefrontal circuitry 
uh, during the adolescent period to see if we can gain more traction or help show those CBT treatments that are working during this time how they're actually using that and they don't even know it to sort of give more evidence-based for those systems that are working. And so I just want to end by, again, acknowledging Sacrites now and then, back then. Thank you.